At this part of my journal were inserted several pages full of details very discreditable to the Archbishop of Moline, which were received from the Emperor's own mouth or collected from the different individuals about him. I, however, strike them out in consideration of the satisfaction which I was informed the Emperor subsequently experienced in perusing Mr. Duprat's concordats. For my own part, I am perfectly satisfied with numerous other testimonies of the same nature and derived from the same source. An honorable and voluntary acknowledgement is a thousand times better than all the retorts that can be heaped upon an offender. There are persons to whom atonement is not without its due weight. I am one of these... Just as I had written above, I happen to read some lines from the pen of the Abbe de Prat, which are certainly very fine with respect to diction, but which is still finer on account of their justice and truth. I cannot refrain from transcribing them here as they make ample amends for those already quoted, a declaration of the Allied sovereigns at Laybach, in which Napoleon was, in terms of reprobation, pronounced to be the representative of the revolution, called forth the following observations from the Archbishop of Malines. It is too late to insult Napoleon now that he is defenseless after having for so many years crouched at his feet while he had the power to punish. Those who are armed should respect a disarmed enemy and the glory of the conqueror depends in a great measure on the consideration shown towards the captive, particularly when he yields to superior force, not to superior genius. It is too late to call Napoleon a revolutionist after having for such a length of time pronounced him to be the restorer of order in France and through France and Europe. It is too late for those to aim the shaft of insult at him who once stretched forth their hands to him as a friend, pledged their faith to him as an ally, and sought to prop a tottering throne by mingling their blood with his. Farther on, he says, he is the representative of the revolution. The revolution broke the bonds of union between France and Rome. He renewed them. The revolution overthrew the temples of the Almighty. He restored them. The revolution created two classes of clergy hostile to each other. He reconciled them. The revolution profaned Saint-Denis. He purified it and offered expiation to the ashes of kings. The revolution subverted the throne. He raised it up and added a new luster to it. The revolution banished from their country the nobility of France. He opened to them the gates of France and of his palace. Though he knew them to be his irreconcilable enemies, and for the most part the enemies of the public institutions, he reincorporated them with the society from which they have been separated, this representative of a revolution which is distinguished by the epithet antisocial, brought from Rome the head of the Catholic Church to anoint his brow with the oil that consecrates diadems. This representative of a revolution which has been declared hostile sovereignty filled Germany with kings, advanced the rank of princes, restored superior royalty, and reconstructed a defaced model, the representative of the revolution which is condemned as the principle of anarchy. Just like another Justinian drew up amidst the din of war and the snares of foreign policy, those codes which are the least effective portion of human legislature, and constructed the most vigorous machine of government in the whole world. This representative of a revolution which is vulgarly accused of having subverted all institutions, restored universities and public schools, filled his empire with masterpieces of art, and accomplished those amazing and stupendous works which reflect honor on human genius, and yet in the face of the Alps which bowed down at his command of the ocean, subdued at Cherbourg, at Flushing, at the Helder, and at Antwerp of rivers smoothly flowing beneath the bridges of Yenna, Ceres, Bordeaux, and Turan, of canals, uniting seas together in a chorus beyond the control of Neptune. Finally, in the face of Paris, metamorphosed as it is by Napoleon, he is pronounced to be the agent of general destruction. He who restored all is said to be 
the representative of that which destroyed all? To what undiscerning man is this language supposed to be addressed? ETC. The 17th. The Empress summoned me at 2 o'clock. When he began the dress on entering, he observed that I looked pale. I replied that it might be owing to the atmosphere of my chamber, which, from its proximity to the kitchen, was an absolute oven, being frequently filled with smoke. He then expressed a wish that I should constantly occupy the topographic cabinet in which I might write during the day and sleep at night, and a bed which the admiral had fitted up for the emperor himself, but which he did not make use of as he preferred his own camp bed. When he had finished dressing and was choosing between two or three snuff boxes which lay before him, he abruptly gave one to his valet de chambre. Marchand, put that by, said he. It is always meeting my eye, and it hurts me. I know not what was on the snuff box, but I imagine it was the portrait of the king of Rome. The emperor left his apartment, and I followed him. I went over the house and entered my chamber, seeing a dressing glass. He inquired whether it was the one he had given me. And putting his hand to the wall, which was heated by the kitchen, he again observed that I could not possibly remain in that room and absolutely insisted on my occupying his bed in the topographic cabinet, adding in a tone of captivating kindness, that it was the bed of a friend. We walked out and proceeded towards a wretched farm, which was within sight. On our way, we saw the barracks of the Chinese. These Chinese are laboring men who enlist on board English ships at Macau and who continued to say Helena in the service of the East India Company for a certain number of years when they returned to their homes after collecting a little store of money as the people of Alvernia do in France. The emperor wished to ask us some questions, but we could not make ourselves understood by them. We next visited what is called Longwood Farm. The emperor was seduced by the name. He expected to find one of the delightful farms of Flanders or England, but this was merely on a level with our lowest Mitteries. We afterwards went down to the company's garden, which is formed in the hollow where the two opposite ravines meet. And for called the gardener and the man who tends to the company's cattle and superintends the Chinese, of whom he asked many questions, he returned home very much fatigued, though we had scarcely walked a mile. This was his first excursion. Before dinner, the emperor summoned me and my son to our accustomed task. He said I had been idle and called my attention to my son, who was laughing behind my back. He asked why he laughed, and I replied that it was probably because his majesty was taking revenge for him. I said he's smiling. I see I'm acting the part of the grandfather here the 18th through 19th. By degrees, our hours and habits began to be fixed and regular. About 10 o'clock, the emperor breakfasted in his own chamber, and one of us occasionally attended him at the table of the household. We breakfasted at nearly the same hour. The emperor granted us permission to do the honors of this table as we pleased and to invite to it whomsoever we might think fit. No hours were yet fixed for the emperor's walk. The heat was very great during the day, and the damp came on speedily, and in great excess towards evening. We were informed some time before that coach and saddle horses were coming from the Cape, but they never arrived. During the day, the emperor was engaged in dictating two different individuals of his suite, and he usually reserved for me the interval preceding dinner, which was not served until 8 or 9 o'clock. He required my attendance about 5 or 6 o'clock, together with my son. I could neither write nor read, owing to the state of my eyes, but my son was unable to supply my place. He wrote by the emperor's dictation. I was present only to help him afterwards to correct his hasty scrawl, for by dint of habit, I could repeat almost literally and entirely all that had fallen from the emperor. The campaign of Italy being now finished, we began to revise it, and the emperor corrected and dictated anew. We dined. As I have before observed, between 8 and 9 o'clock, the table was laid out in the room nearest the entrance to the house. Madame de Montalon sat on the right of the emperor, I on his left, and Messieurs de Montalon, Gorgal, and my son sat in the opposite places. 
because the room still smelled of paint, particularly when the weather was damp. And though not very offensive, it was sufficiently annoying to the emperor. We therefore sat no longer than 10 minutes at table. The dessert was prepared in the adjoining apartment, which was the drawing room, and we again seated ourselves around the table. Coffee was then served up, and conversation commenced. We read a few scenes from Moliere, a scene at Voltaire, and always regretted not having a copy of Cornea. We then played at River City, which had been the Emperor's favorite game in his youth. The recollection was pleasing to him, and he at first thought it would amuse himself for a length of time at it. But he was soon undeceived. We played at the game and all its varieties, which made it so complex that I had seen from 15 to 18,000 counters in use at once. The emperor's aim was always to make the reverses, that is to say, to make every trick, which is no easy matter. However, he frequently succeeded. Character develops itself everywhere and in everything. We retired about 10 or 11 o'clock. Today, the 19th, when I paid my respects to the emperor, he showed me a libel upon himself, which had fallen into his hands and asked me to translate it amidst a mass of other nonsense. Some private letters were mentioned, which were said to have been addressed by Napoleon to the Empress Josephine under the solemn form of Madame Escher Epouza. Allusion was next made to a combination of spies and agents by whose aid the emperor knew the private affairs of every family in France and penetrated the secrets of all the cabinets of Europe. The emperor wished to proceed no farther and made me lay aside the book saying, it is too absurd. The fact is that in his private correspondence, Napoleon always addressed the Empress Josephine very unfashionably by the pronoun thou too. And my good little Louisa, ma bonne petite Louise, was the form by which he addressed Maria Louisa. The first time I ever saw the emperor running hand was at St. Clue after the Battle of Friedland when the Empress Josephine amused herself by making us try to decipher a note which she held in her hand and which seemed to be written in hieroglyphics. It was to the following effect. My sons have once more shed a luster over my career. The victory of Friedland will be inscribed in history. Besides those of Marengo, Austerlitz, and Yenna, you will cause the cannon to be fired. Tu feras tirer le canon. Cambaceres will publish the bulletin. I was again favored with the sight of a note in the Emperor's handwriting. At the time of the Treaty of Tilsit, it contained the following. The Queen of Prussia is really a charming woman. She is fond of coquetting with me, but do not be jealous. I am like the cloth along which everything of this sort slides without penetrating it would cost me too dear to play the gallant on this subject an antidote is related in the saloon of josephine it was said that the queen of prussia one day had a beautiful rose in her hand which the emperor asked her to give him the queen hesitated for a few moments and then presented it to him saying why should I so readily grant you what you request while you remain deaf to all my entreaties? She alluded to the fortress of Magdeburg, which she had earnestly solicited. Such was the nature of the intimacy and such the conversations that were so unblushingly misrepresented in English works of a certain degree of merit, where the emp was described as an insolent and brutal tyrant, seeking with the aid of his ferocious mamelukes to violate the honor of the lovely queen under the very eyes of her unfortunate husband. As to the grand machinery of spies and police, which has been so much talked of, what state of the continent could boast of having less of such evils in France? And yet what country stood more in need of them? What circumstance? More imperiously called for them. Every pamphlet published in Europe was directed against France with a view of rendering odious in another country that which it was thought advisable to conceal at home. Still, however, these measures so necessary in principle, though doubtless hateful in their details, were looked at merely in a general way by the emperor and always with the strict observance of his constant maxim that nothing should be done that is not absolutely indispensable. In the council of state, I have frequently heard him make inquiries into these subjects, investigate them with peculiar solicitude, correct abuses, and seek to obviate evils, and appoint committees of his council to visit the prisons and make reports to him. 
having been myself employed in a mission of this nature, I had an opportunity of observing the misconduct and abuses of subaltern agents and at the same time of knowing the ardent wishes of the sovereign to repress them. The emperor found that this branch of the administration in a certain degree clashed with established prejudices and opinions. And he therefore wished to elevate it in the eyes of the people by placing it under the control of a man whose character was beyond the reach of censure. In the year 1810, he summoned the Councilor of State Baron Blank to Fontainebleau. The Baron had been an emigrant, or what nearly amounted to the same thing. His family, his early education, his former opinions, all were calculated to render him an object of suspicion to one more distrustful than Napoleon. In the course of conversation, the emperor said, if the Count de Lille were now to discover himself in Paris and you were entrusted with the superintendents of the police, would you arrest him? Yes, certainly, answered the Councilor of State, because he would thereby have broken his ban and because his appearance would be in opposition to every existing law. If you were one of a committee appointed to try him, would you condemn him? Yes, doubtless, for the laws which I have sworn to obey would require that I should condemn him. Very well, said the emperor. Turn to Paris. I make you my prefect of police. With regard to the inspection of letters under the government of Napoleon, whatever may have been publicly said on that subject, the emperor declared that certainly very few letters were read at the post offices. Those which were delivered, either open or resealed, to private persons have, for the most part, not been read. To read all would have been an endless task. The system of examining letters was adopted with the view of preventing, rather than discovering dangerous correspondence, the letters that were really read exhibited no trace of having been opened so effectual were the precautions employed ever since the reign of louis the 14th said the emperor there had existed an office of political police for discovering foreign correspondence and from that period the same families had managed the business of the office though the individuals and their functions were alike unknown it was in all respects an official post the persons superintending this department were educated at great expense in the different capitals of Europe. They had their own peculiar notions of propriety and always manifested reluctance to examine the home correspondence. It was, however, also under their control. As soon as the name of any individual was entered upon the list of this important department, his arms and seals were immediately engraved at the office. And thus his letters, after having been read, were closed up and delivered without any mark of suspicion. These circumstances joined to the serious evils they might create and the important results they were capable of producing constituted the vast responsibility of the office of postmaster general and required that it should be filled by a man of prudent judgment and intelligence. The emperor bestowed great praise on Monsieur de Lavalette for the way in which he discharged his duties. The emperor was by no means favorable to the system of inspecting correspondence with regard to the diplomatic information thereby obtained. He did not consider it of sufficient value to counterbalance the expenses incurred for the establishment cost 600,000 francs as to the examination of the letters of citizens. He regarded that as a measure calculated to do more harm than good. It is rarely said he that conspiracy is carried on through such channels and with respect to the individual opinions obtained from epistolary correspondence, they may be more dangerous and useful to a sovereign, particularly among such people as the French, of whom will not our national volatility and fickleness lead us to complain. A man whom I may have offended in my living will write today that I'm a tyrant, though. But yesterday he overwhelmed me with praises, and perhaps tomorrow will be ready to lay down his life to serve me. The violation of the privacy of correspondence may therefore cause a prince to lose his best friends by wrongfully inspiring him with distrust and prejudice towards all, particularly as enemies capable of mischief are always sufficiently artful to avoid exposing themselves to that kind of danger. Some of my ministers were so cautious in this respect that I could never succeed in detecting one of their letters. I think... I have already mentioned that on the emperor's return from Elba, 
They were found in Mr. de Blecka's apartments in the Tuileries, numerous petitions and letters in which Napoleon was spoken of most indecorously. He caused them to be burnt. They would have formed the most odious collection, said the emperor for a moment. I entertain the idea of inserting some of them in the monitor. They would have disgraced certain individuals, but they would have afforded no new lesson on the human heart. Men are always the same. The emperor was far from knowing all the measures taken by the police in his name with respect to writings and individuals. He had neither time nor opportunity to inquire into them. He now daily learns from us or from pamphlets that happen to fall in his way, the arrests of individuals or the suppression of works of which he had never before heard in alluding to the works that had been suppressed by the police during his reign. The emperor observed that having plenty of leisure time during his stay at Elba, he amused himself with glancing over some of these works and that he was frequently unable to conceive the motives that had induced the police to suppress them. He then proceeded to converse on the subject of the liberty and restriction of the press this he said was an interminable question and admitted of no medium the grand difficulty he observed did not lie in the principle itself but in the treatment of the accused party or the circumstances under which it might be necessary to apply the principle taken in an abstract sense the emperor would have been favorable to unlimited liberty in all our conversations at St. Helena, he constantly treated every great question in the same point of view and with the same arguments. Thus, Napoleon truly was and must remain in the eyes of posterity the type, the standard, and the prince of liberal opinions. They belonged to his heart, to his principles, and to his mind. His actions sometimes seemed at variance with these ideas. It was when he was imperiously swayed by circumstances this is proved by the following fact to which i now attach more importance than i did when it first came to my knowledge in one of the evening parties at the tuileries napoleon conversing aside with three or four individuals of the court who were grouped around him closed a discussion on a great political question with the following remarkable words for my part i am fundamentally and naturally favorable to a fixed and moderate government and observing that the countenance of one of the interlocutors expressed surprise. You don't believe me, continued he. Why not? Is it because my deeds do not seem to accord with my words? My dear sir, how little you know of men and things. Is the necessity of the moment nothing in your eyes? Were I to slacken the reins only for a moment, we should have fine disorder. Neither you nor I would probably sleep another night at the Tuileries. The 20th through the 23rd, the emperor mounted his horse after breakfast. We directed our course towards the farm. We found the farmer in the company's garden, and he attended us over the whole of the grounds. The emperor asked him a number of questions respecting his farm, as he used to do during his hunting excursions in the neighborhood of Versailles, where he discussed with the farmers the opinions of the council of state in order to bring forward to the council in their turn the objections of the farmers. We advanced through the grounds of Longwood in a line parallel with the valley until finding no farther road for the horses, we were compelled to turn back. We then crossed the little valley, gained the height where the troops were encamped advanced to the alarm hill and passing over its summit we arrived beyond the camp near the alarm house on the road leading from longwood to madame Bertrand's residence the emperor at first proposed calling on her but when about halfway thither he changed his mind and we returned to longwood the instructions of the english ministers with regard to the emperor at saint helena were dictated in that disgraceful spirit of harshness which in europe had urged the solemn violation of the law of nations an english officer was to be constantly at the emperor's table this cruel measure was of course calculated to deprive us of the comforts of familiar intercourse the order was not carried into effect only because the emperor had it been enforced, would have taken his meals in his own chamber. I have very good reason to believe that he regretted not having done so. On board the Northumberland, an English officer was to accompany the emperor in his 
rides on horseback. This was a severe annoyance, which rendered it impossible that his mind could for a moment be diverted from his unfortunate situation. This order was not, however, enforced within certain limits, which were prescribed to us because the emperor had declared that he would not ride on horseback at all under such conditions. In our melancholy situation, every day brought with it some new cause of uneasiness. We were constantly suffering some new sting, which seemed the more cruel as we were destined to endure it for a long futurity. Lacerated as our feelings undoubtedly were, each fresh wound was sensibly felt, and the motives that were assigned for our vexations frequently assumed the appearance of irony. The sentinels were posted beneath the emperor's windows and before our doors. And this, we were informed, was for our own safety. We were impeded in our communications with the inhabitants of the island. We were put under a kind of close confinement and were told that this was done to free the emperor from all annoyance. The passwords and orders were incessantly changed. We lived in the continual perplexity and apprehension of being exposed to some unforeseen insult. The emperor, whose feelings were keenly alive to all these things, resolved to write to the admiral through the medium of Mr. de Montalone. He spoke with warmth and made some observations worthy of remark. But not the admiral, suppose, said he, that I shall treat him with him on any of these subjects were he to present himself to me tomorrow in spite of my just resentment he would find my countenance as serene and my temper as composed as usual this would not be the effect of dissimulation on my part but merely the fruit of experience i recollect that lord whitworth once filled europe with the report of a long conversation that he had with me scarcely a word of which was true but that was my fault, and it taught me to be more cautious in future. The emperor has governed too long not to know that he must not commit himself to the discretion of any one who may have it in his power to say falsely, the emperor told me so and so. While the emperor may not have the means of either affirming or contradicting the statement, one witness is as good as another. It is therefore necessary to employ someone who may be enabled to tell the narrator that in attributing such and such words to the emperor, he speaks false, and that he is ready to give him satisfaction for this expression, which the emperor himself cannot do. Monsieur de Montsalon's letter was couched in sharp terms. The reply was insulting, of course. No such thing as an emperor was known in St. Helena. The justice and moderation of the English government towards us would be the admiration of future ages, ETC. Dr. O'Meara was instructed to accompany this written reply with verbal additions to the most offensive nature to inquire, for example, whether the emperor wished that the admiral should send him sundry atrocious libels and anonymous letters which had been received addressed to him, etc. I was engaged with the emperor at the time this answer was communicated to him. I could not conceal my astonishment and indignation at certain expressions that were employed. But we could only let philosophy take place of resentment. It was sufficient to reflect that all satisfaction was beyond our reach. To address a direct complaint to the prince regent would perhaps have been to furnish a gratification to that prince, as well as a recommendation to him who had offended us. Besides, the emperor could not address complaints to any individual on earth. He could appeal only to the tribunal of heaven, nations, and posterity. On the 23rd, the Doris frigate arrived from the Cape, bringing seven horses that had been purchased there for the emperor. The 24th, the emperor had been reading some publication in which he was made to speak in too amiable a strain, and he could not help exclaiming against the mistake of the writer. How could they put these words in my mouth, said he. This is too tender, too sentimental for me. Everyone knows that I do not express myself in that way. Sire, I replied, it was said with a good intention. The thing is innocent in itself and may have produced a good effect. That reputation for amiability, which you seem to despise, might have exercised great influence over public opinion. It might at least have counteracted the effect of the coloring in which a certain European system has falsely exhibited your majesty to the world. Your heart 
with which I am now acquainted is certainly as good as that of Henry the Fourth, which I did not know. Now his amiableness of character is still proverbial. He is still held up as an idol, yet I suspect Henry the Fourth was a bit of a quack, and why should your majesty have disdained? in disdain to be so. You have too great an aversion to that system. After all, quackery rules the world. And it is fortunate when it happens to be only innocent. The emperor laughed at what he termed my prosing. What, said he, is the advantage of popularity and amiability of character who possess those qualities in a more eminent degree than the unfortunate Louis the Sixteenth? Yet, what was his fate? His life was sacrificed. No, a sovereign must serve his people with dignity and not make it his chief study to please them. The best mode of winning their love is to secure their welfare. Nothing is more dangerous than for a sovereign to flatter his subjects. If they do not afterwards obtain everything they want, they become irritated and fancy their promises have been broken. And if they are then resisted, their hatred increases in proportion as they consider themselves deceived. A sovereign's first duty is doubtless to conform with the wishes of the people, but what the people say is scarcely ever what they wish their desires and their wants cannot be learned from their own mouths so well as they are to be read in the heart of their prince each system may no doubt be maintained that of mildness as well as that of severity each has its advantages and its disadvantages for everything is mutually balanced in this world if you ask me what was the use of my severe forms and expressions i shall answer to spare me the pain of inflicting the punishment i threaten what harm have i done after all what blood have i shed who can boast that had he been placed in my situation he could have done better what period of history exhibiting anything like the difficulties with which I was surrounded presents such harmless results? What am I reproached with? My government archives and my private papers were seized. Yet, what has there been found and published to the world? All sovereigns, situated as I was amidst factions, disorders, and conspiracies, are surrounded by murders and executions. Yet during my reign, what sudden tranquility pervaded France? You are no doubt astonished at this chain of reflection, continued he smiling. You, who frequently display the mildness and simplicity of a child, I could not but admit the force of his arguments, and now in my turn maintain that both systems might have their peculiar advantages. Every individual said I should form for himself a character by means of education, but he should be careful at the same time to lay its foundation on the character he has received from nature. Otherwise, he runs a risk of losing the advantages of the latter without obtaining those of the character which he wishes to acquire, and his education may prove an instrument to mislead him. After all, the course of a man's life is the true result of his character and the proper test by which it should be judged of what then can i have to complain from the lowest degree of misery i raised myself by my own efforts to tolerable independence and from the streets of london i penetrated to the steps of your throne and to the benches of your council chamber all this too without having cause to blush in the presence of any individual for anything that I have ever spoken, written, or done, have I not then also performed my little wonders in my own little way? What could I have done better had another turn been given to my character? The conversation was here interrupted by someone entering to announce that the admiral and some ladies who had arrived by the door solicited the favor being presented to the emperor. But he answered dryly that he would see no one, and that he did not wish to be disturbed. Under our present circumstances, the personal politeness of the admiral was felt only as an additional insult, and with regard to those who accompanied him, as no one could approach us but with the admiral's permission, the emperor did not choose that the honors of his person should be thus performed. If it were intended that he should remain in close confinement, he ought to be told so, but if not, he should be allowed to see whom he pleased without the interference of any person. Above all, it was not fair that they should pretend in Europe to surround him with every sort of attention and respect, while on the contrary, they were annoying him with every kind of intercorum and caprice. The emperor 
walked out in the guard at five o'clock. The colonel of the 53rd Regiment waited on him there and begged permission to present to him next day the officers of his regiment. The emperor granted his request and appointed three o'clock as the hour to receive them. The general took his leave and we prolonged our walk. The emperor stopped a while to look at a flower in one of the beds and asked me whether it was not a lily. It was indeed a magnificent one. After dinner, while we were playing our usual game of reverses, of which, by the by, the emperor began to grow weary, he suddenly turned to me and said, Where do you suppose Madame Las Cases is at this moment? Alas, sire, replied, Heaven knows. She's in Paris, continued he. Today is Tuesday. It is nine o'clock. She is now at the opera. No, sire. She is too good a wife to go to the theater while I'm here. Spoken like a true husband, said the emperor, laughing, ever confident and credulous. Then turning to General Gorgow, he rallied him in the same style with respect to his mother and sister. Gorgow seemed very much downcast, and his eyes were suffused with tears, which the emperor, perceiving, cast a sideways glance towards him and said in the most interesting manner, How wicked, barbarous, and tyrannical I must be to thus trifle with feelings so tender. The emperor then asked me how many children I had and when and how I had become acquainted with Madame Las Casas. I replied that my wife had been the first acquaintance of my life, that our marriage was a tie which we had ourselves formed in early youth, yet that it had required the occurrence of the greater part of the events of the revolution to bring about its accomplishment. The 25th, the emperor who had not been well the preceding evening, was still indisposed this morning and sent word that it would be impossible for him to receive the officers of the 53rd as he had appointed. He sent for me about the middle of the day. And we again perused some chapters of the campaign of Italy. I compared that which treats on the Battle of Arcole to the Book of the Iliad. Sometime before the dinner hour, he assembled us all around him in his chamber. A servant entered to announce the dinner was ready. He sent us away, but as I was going out last, he called me back. Stay here, said he. We will dine together. Let the young people go. We old folks will keep one another company. He then determined to dress, intending, as he said, to go into the drawing room after dinner. While he was dressing, he put his hand on his left thigh, where there was a deep scar. He called my attention to it by laying his finger in it and finding that I did not understand what it was. He told me that it was the mark of a bayonet wound by which he had nearly lost his limb at the siege of Toulon. Marchand, who was dressing him here, took the liberty of remarking that the circumstance was well known on board the Northumberland, that one of the crew had told him on going on board that it was an Englishman who first wounded our emperor. The emperor on this observed that people had in general wondered and talked a great deal of the singular good fortune which had preserved him, as it were, invulnerable in so many battles. They were mistaken, added he. The only reason was that I always made a secret of all my dangers. He then related that he had had three horses killed under him at sieges of Toulon, several others killed and wounded in his campaign in Italy, and three or four at the siege of saint jean dacre he added that he had been wounded several times, that at the Battle of Radisbon, a ball had struck his heel, and at the Battle of Essling or Bagram, I cannot say which, another had torn his boot and stocking and grazed the skin of his left leg in 1814. He lost a horse in his hat at R.C. Sir Alba or in its neighborhood. After the Battle of Brienne, as he was returning to headquarters in the evening in a melancholy and pensive mood, he was suddenly attacked by some Cossacks who had passed over into the rear of the army. He thrust one of them off with his hand and was obliged to draw his sword in his own defense. Several of the Cossacks were killed at his side. But what renders this circumstance very extraordinary, said he, is that it took place near a tree, which at that moment caught my eye and which I recognize as the very very one under which, when I was but 12 years old, I used to sit during the play hours and read Jerusalem Delivered. Doubtless on that spot, Napoleon had been first fired by. 
for love of glory. The emperor repeated that he had been very frequently exposed to danger in his different battles, but it was carefully kept secret. He had enjoined once for all the most absolute silence in all circumstances of that nature. He said it would be impossible to calculate the confusion and disorder which might have resulted from the slightest report or the smallest doubt relative to his existence on his life depended the fate of a great empire and the whole policy and destinies of Europe. He added that this habit of keeping circumstances of that kind secret had prevented him from relating them in his campaigns and indeed he had now almost forgotten them. It was only, he said, by mere accident and in the course of conversation that he could recur to them. The 26th, the emperor continued indisposed. One of the English gentlemen whose wife had yesterday been refused admittance in company with the admiral paid me a visit this morning with the view of making another and final attempt to get presented to Napoleon. This gentleman spoke French very well, having resided in France during the whole of the war. He was one of those individuals who were known at the time by the title of Detenu who, having visited France as travelers, were arrested there by the First Consul on their rupture of the Treaty of Amiens as a reprisal for the seizure of our merchant ships by the English government according to its custom. Before the declaration of war, this event gave rise to a long and animated discussion between the two governments and even prevented during the whole of the war a cartel for the exchange of prisoners. The English ministers persisted in refusing to consider their detained countrymen as prisoners, lest they should in so doing make an implicit renunciation of what may perhaps be called their right of piracy. However, their obstinacy cost their countrymen a long captivity. They were detained in France for more than 10 years. Their absence was as long and as irksome though not so glorious as that of the besiegers of Troy. This English gentleman was a brother-in-law of Admiral Burton, the commander on the Indian station who lately died. This circumstance might very possibly procure for him an immediate communication with ministers. On his arrival in England, he might perhaps have been appointed by the admiral to be the bearer of intelligence respecting us. Instead, therefore, of declining conversation, I prolonged it. It lasted more than two hours and was all calculated on my part with a view to what he might repeat to the admiral or communicate to the government or private circles in England. I will not tire my readers by a recital of it. They would only find the same eternal reca recapitulation of our reproaches and grievances, a repetition of our complaints and vexations, a continued exposure of the violation of those laws which are esteemed most sacred, of the outrage of our good faith, of the arrogance, impudence, and petty insolence of power. I dwelt particularly on the ill treatment to which we were here exposed and on the caprices of the individual who was appointed our keeper. His glory, said I, should consist not in oppressing, but in relieving us. He should endeavor to make us forget by his attentions all the rigor and injustice of his country's policy. Can he court the reprobation of mankind when his good fortune enables him to connect his name gloriously with that of the man of the age, the hero of history? Can he object that he is bound by his instructions, but even then in the spirit of our European manners, honor enables him to interpret them in a suitable manner. The Englishman listened to me with great attention. He seemed occasionally to take particular interest in what I said and expressed his approbation of several of my remarks. But was he sincere? And will he not express very different sentiments in London? Whenever a ship arrives in England from St. Helena, the public papers immediately give insertion to various stories relative to the captives at Longwood of so false and absurd a nature as must necessarily render them ridiculous to the great mass of the public. We were expressed our indignation at these idle reports in the presence of honorable and distinguished Englishmen here. They replied, do not deceive yourselves. These false accounts proceed not from our countrymen who visit you, but from our ministers in London. For to the excess and violence of power, the administration by which we are now ruled adds all the meanness of the lowest and vilest intrigues. 
27th, the emperor felt himself better and rode out on horseback about one o'clock. On his return, he received the officers of the 53rd and behaved to them in the most amiable and condescending manner. After this visit, the emperor, who had desired me to remain with him, walked in the garden. I there gave him an account of the conversation I had had the day before with the Englishman. He then asked me some questions relative to the French emigrants, London, and the English. I told him that though the emigrants in a body did not like the English, yet there were a few who did not become attached to some Englishman or other, that though the English were not fond of the emigrants, yet there were few English families who did not show themselves friendly to some of the French. This is the real key to those sentiments and reports so often contradictory that are met with on the subject. With regard to the kindness we have received from the English, particularly the middle class, from whom the character of a nation is always to be learned, it is beyond all expression and has entailed a heavy debt of gratitude upon us, it would be difficult to enumerate the private benefactions, the benevolent institutions, and the charitable measures by which our distresses were relieved. The example of individuals induced the government to assist us by regular allowances, and even when these were granted, private benevolence did not cease. The emperor here asked me whether I had been a share in the grants supplied by the English government. I told him that I had felt more pleasure in being indebted for support solely to my own exertions and that the state of society and encouragement of industry in English were such that with this feeling a man was sure to succeed on two occasions. I had an opportunity of making my fortune. Colbert, Bishop of Rhodes, a native of Scotland, who was very fond of me, proposed that I should accompany his brother to Jamaica, where he was appointed to the head of the executive power where he was one of the most considerable planters. He would have entrusted to me the direction of his property and would have obtained for me other employment of the same kind. The bishop assured me that I should make a fortune in three years. I could not, however, prevail on myself to go. I preferred continuing a life of poverty to removing to a greater distance from the French shore. On another occasion, continued I, some friends wished to persuade me to go to India, where I should have obtained employment and patronage and was assured that in a short time I should realize a considerable fortune. But this I declined. I thought myself too old to travel so far. This was 22 years ago. And yet I am now at St. Helena. However, there were few who suffered greater hardships than I did at the commencement of my emigration and who enjoyed greater comforts towards its close. I have more than once found myself on the point of being entirely destitute of everything. Still, I was never discouraged or dejected. I consoled myself with the treasure of philosophy and compared my own condition with that of numbers around me who were more wretched than myself, to old men and women, for example, to whose were destitute of des education or who wanting the faculties requisite for acquiring a foreign language were thus cut off from all resources. I was young, full of hope, and capable of exertion. I taught what I did not well know myself, whatever was asked of me, and I learned overnight what I might have to teach on the succeeding day. My historical atlas was a fortunate idea which opened in me a mine of gold. At that period, however, I had executed only an outline of my plan, but in London, everything is encouraged. Everything sells, and moreover, heaven blessed my exertions. I landed at the mouth of the Thames and reached London on foot with only seven Louis in my pocket, without a friend, without an introduction in a foreign land, but I left it in a post chaise, possessed of 2,500 guineas, having gained many dear friends to serve, whom I would gladly have sacrificed my life. But supposing I had been an emigrant, said the emperor, what would have been my lot? He took a view of various professions, but decided in favor of a soldier's life. I should have fulfilled my career after all, said he. That is not quite certain, I observed. Sire, you would have been smothered in the crowd. On arriving at Coblenz in any French corps, you would have been placed according to your rank on the list without any possibility of getting beyond it. For we were rigid observers of forms, etc. The emperor then inquired when and how I had returned to France. After the peace of Amiens, said I, availing myself of the benefit of your amnesty, yet I joined an English family and slipped in 
in a sort of contraband way in order to reach Paris earlier than I otherwise could have done. Immediately on my arrival there, fearing lest I should compromise that family, I went in person to make my declaration to the police and received the paper which I was to present for inspection once a week or once a month. I paid no attention to it, but nothing happened to me through my neglect. I had determined on conducting myself with prudence and therefore felt satisfied that I had nothing to fear. At one time, however, I saw that my intention might have cost me dear. It was during the most violent crisis of the affair of George and Pichigrew. I usually passed my evenings in the society of intimate friends in my own house to scarcely ever went out on this occasion, however, impelled by fate or perhaps by the strong interest which I took in passing events. I strolled about in the Faubourg Saint-Germain till rather a late hour in the evening I missed the way to the Pont de Louis the Sixteenth, which I knew so well and came out upon the Boulevard des Invalides, without knowing where I was, the posts were everywhere increased in number, and each consisted of a double guard. I inquired my way of one of the sentinels, and I distinctly heard his comrade, who was a few yards off, ask him why he had not stopped me. He answered that I was doing no harm. I hastened home as fast as I could, terrified at the danger I had so narrowly escaped. I was in formal contravention to the police. The circumstances of my emigration, my name, my habits, and my opinions all tended to identify me with the malcontents. Every inquiry that could have been instituted respecting me would have been to my prejudice. I could not have referred to anyone, and what alarmed me still more that they would have found five guineas in my pocket. I had, it is true, been in France for two years, but these guineas were the last fruits of my industry. I always carried them about me, and I have them with me still. I used to take a pleasure in seeing them. They reminded me of a beard of misfortune which had gone by. It is easy to conceive the conclusions which might have been drawn from so many concurring circumstances. In vain would have been my denials and assertions. No credit would have been given to me. I should no doubt have suffered considerably, and yet I was not in the least to blame. Such is the justice of men. However, I never took the trouble to arrange my business with the police, and yet I never got into any difficulty. When I was presented at your majesty's court, the emigrants who were in the same situation as myself and have been placed under the superintendence of the police for 10 years applied for their emancipation, which they procured. For my part, I determined to let my surveillance die a natural death, being invited in your majesty's name to a fete at Fontainebleau. I thought it would be a good jest to apply to the police for a passport. They agreed that it was, strictly speaking, necessary, but declined giving it on the grounds that it would tend to make government ridiculous. At a subsequent period, having become your majesty's chamberlain, I had occasion to go on a private journey, and they then exempted me from all future formality on your majesty's return in 1815, being desirous of serving some emigrants who had returned with the king. I went in their name to the police, being a counselor of state. All the registers were open to me after having inspected the article relating to my friends. I felt a curiosity to refer to my own. I found myself designated as a distinguished court of the Comte d'Artois in London, I could not help reflecting on the difference of times and the changes produced by revolution. However, my register was altogether incorrect. I certainly visited the Comte d'Artois, but not oftener than once a month. As to my being a courtier, if I had been ever so much inclined to be one, the thing was out of my power. I had to provide for my daily subsistence, and I had pride enough to wish to live by my own industry. My time was therefore valuable. The emperor was very much amused by my story, and I felt much pleasure in relating it to him. The frigate Doris has sailed this day for Europe. The 28th, Mr. Balcombe's family called in the hope of seeing the emperor, but he was again indisposed. His health declines. This place is evidently unfavorable to him. He sent for me at three o'clock. He was slightly feverish, but felt himself better. He spoke a good deal of the domestic arrangements of the house, which sometimes annoyed him. He then dressed with the intention of going out. I persuaded him to resume his flannel under waistcoat, which he had laid aside very imprudently. In this damp and variable climate, we took a walk in the garden, and the conversation continued to turn on the same subject as before. The emperor strolled about at random, and we came to the gum trees which run along the park, conversing on our local situation and our relations with the authorities and speculating on the political events of Europe. 
We were overtaken by a shower of rain and were forced to take shelter under a tree. The Grand Marshal and Monsieur de Montalon soon joined us. The Emperor made me return with him. And when we got home, we played a game at piquet in the drawing room with Madame de Montalon. As it was very damp, the Emperor ordered a fire. But as soon as it was lighted, we were driven away by the smoke and were compelled to take refuge in the Emperor's chamber. Here, uh, the game was resumed. But it was very soon suspended by the emperor's conversation, which became most interesting. He entertained us with anecdotes and minute details of his domestic life and confirmed, corrected, or contradicted those which Madame de Montalon and myself related to him as having been publicly circulated. Nothing could be more gratifying. The conversation was quite confidential, and we sincerely regretted its interruption by the announcement of dinner.